So thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight, I want to talk to you about humanity's adventure into space. And most people, when they talk about humanity's adventure into space, they talk about the first launch to the moon, the Apollo 11 mission. Or perhaps they'll talk about the beginning of the space race in 1957, with the launch of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union. Maybe, if they're feeling ambitious, they'll talk about the development of the V-2 rocket in the Second World War by Nazi Germany. But I want to take us a little bit further back, that I mean centuries, to Isaac Newton, when he first published his Three Laws of Motion in 1687. I love these pictures. <laughs> so these laws of motion are important for uh, rocketry in general because these laws of motion are what are used to calculate the trajectories of rockets as they, as they move around massive bodies. And in 1813, a British mathematician, William Moore, derived for the first time the rocket equation, which we do uh, use for rockets, surprisingly. And not much is known about him because he was a British mathematician and a lot of historical records were destroyed by the bombings of Nazi Germany in the Second World War. Now, moving on to 1926, we begin the first systematic testing of rocketry and these rocket equations uh, by Robert Godard, who started testing in 1926 to 1941 35 different rockets. In 1937, he reached his maximum altitude of the test rocket. These were liquid-fueled rockets, and his maximum altitude was around 9,000 feet. In terms of rocketry, that's really not all that impressive, but this is the first time. And this is a good step. This is a necessary step. Meanwhile, in Germany, in 1929, we had, uh, I forget his name, uh, Hermann Oberth, who, uh, with several experimental students, experimentalist students, <laughs> there's an important difference, uh, among whom was Werner von Braun, who would become a leading figure in the development of rocketry. He was 18 at the time, in 1929, which is very impressive. I'm 23, and I still don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> in 1933, uh, Werner von Braun was employed by the military of Nazi Germany in order to start developing the aggregate series of rockets. They constructed the A1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 rockets. The rest of them, A4, B, A6 through 10, were never actually constructed. They were just designed, they were ideas. Of these rockets, the A4 rocket seemed to be the most successful. And this eventually transformed into what we know as today as a V2 rocket. And in 1944, the V2 rocket became the first object to go into space. This is a long time ago. This is very impressive. Now, when I say go into space, uh, this is what we define now as the Kármán line. This is a barrier between what is Earth and what is space. And from now through the rest of the talk, when I say go into space, this is above the Kármán line, 100 kilometers above sea level. In 1945, World War II is coming to a close. The scientists of Nazi Germany need to decide if they're going to surrender to the Soviet Union or to the United States. And uh, Werner von Braun's team decided that they would probably receive better treatment from the United States. And so, that's who they surrendered to. And so the U.S. got Werner von Braun and captured some V-2 rocket technology. And the Soviet Union captured a production factory of the V-2 rocket. And thus begins this race to see who can get the highest ground. And maybe it's not the beginning of the space race, but nonetheless, the U.S. May, has their first uh, designed rocket, it's their own concept, different from the V-2, the Wack Corporal rocket, which makes it 80 kilometers, so that's not quite space. The Kármán line was 100 kilometers. It makes it just below space. But on October 24th of that year, they sent a V-2 rocket 105 kilometers above sea level. So we're into space, and they take this, first picture of Earth from space. 1946, the camera technology was not as good as we have on our iPhones. But you can see some cloud coverage in the general shape of Earth. 
on February 20th. Because why not? The United States sends fruit flies into space with a two rocket. Now this is done to see how cosmic radiation affects life forms in space. And these were the first animals in space. And they did successfully land the fruit flies and recover them alive, and then did extensive studies on them. In 1948, the United States designed rocket, the Aerobe, which is a scientific rocket. It's, it's a sounding rocket. It's not for war, as most of these rockets were. Uh, but it's used to do experiments. That's the purpose. That rocket finally made it into space, an American-designed rocket. And then on June 11th, we had a rhesus monkey, which we named Albert. And we were going to send him into space. Unfortunately, the rocket he was on did not make it to space. It only made it 67 kilometers. And unfortunately, Albert did not make it. So in 1949, we put the V-2 rocket and the WAC Corporal technologies together and make a two-stage rocket. So, we can see the V-2 base and a WAC Corporal rocket on top. It quite literally looks like we just kind of strapped them together and, well, went for that. And this made it up 393 kilometers. So this is quite impressive in the time. We are doing well. We're in leaps and bounds in this race that, mm, could be argued it hasn't quite started yet. On June 14th, just a little after a year, we sent Albert the first, because now we have a new monkey, Albert the second. <laughs> this uh, monkey actually does make it into space and is the first monkey to do so. He makes it above the Kármán line, but unfortunately there is a parachute failure. And that's all I'll say about that. July 22nd, 1951, the Soviet Union sends their first dogs into space. And as a side note, a whole talk could be given on Soviet space dogs. There's a Wikipedia page titled exactly that, Soviet space dogs. Now, this is Saigon and Desik. I'm not sure which one's which, but those are their names. And they were the first dogs in space sent by the Soviet Union. And they were, or they were successfully landed and recovered alive. And most of the missions uh, with the Soviet space dogs, the dogs did make the journey. On September 20th of 1956, the United States decides that three is better than two, which was better than one. And we make a three-stage rocket. This goes 1,100 kilometers into space, much, much higher than the Kármán line and much, much higher than the previous two-stage rocket. And at this point, we decide we are way ahead of the Soviet Union. We've made it 1,100 kilometers into space. But on October 4th, 1957, we were proven wrong. They sent Sputnik 1 into orbit. They didn't just launch things up and watch them fall. It's in orbit. It is flying around the Earth. Now, Sputnik 1, the Soviet Union sent it into space, and if that wasn't bad enough, if that wasn't shoving it in our faces enough, it sent a transmission signal down back to the countries below it, reminding them that it's up there. The Soviet Union had won this part of the race. Less than a month later, they sent Sputnik 2 into orbit, this time compare, er, carrying the first complex life form, Laika the dog, perhaps the most famous Soviet space dog, Meanwhile, on December 6th, back in the U.S., morales were low. We were having a hard time getting off the ground when Vanguard Test Vehicle 3 made it four feet into the air, not doing very well anymore, fell back down to the ground and exploded. Nobody was hurt. This was an unmanned mission, but the morales were exceptionally low at the time. We see this technology gap between us and the Soviet Union, and it's not in our favor. So, we need to get the U.S. Army involved. Um, on January 31st of the next year, the Juno-1 rocket sent the Explorer-1 satellite into orbit. Now, the Vanguard, or sorry, the uh, Sputnik-1, Sputnik-2, and uh, Explorer-1 satellites eventually decayed out of their orbit, fell back into the Earth's atmosphere, and burned up. But on March 17th, we sent up the Vanguard 1 rocket. The Vanguard test series had finally succeeded. And this satellite here is still in orbit. It's the oldest 
man-made object that orbits the Earth. The first two fell down, burned up. This one was predicted to stay in orbit for 240 years at the time. That's pretty impressive. On that same year, on July 29th, uh, Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, which would eventually establish NASA, it, an entity which can dedicate its own time to essentially winning the space race. On August 7th, the U.S. was ahead, so they sent Explorer 6 into orbit, took another picture of Earth, because that's what we like to do. <laughs> September 13th, uh, the Soviet Union sends Luna 2 and crash lands into the, onto the moon, because they need to be higher than us. 1961, it was a year for sending humans into space. The Soviet Union led the way with Yuri Gagarin, and he was the first human into space. But, less than a month later, the uh, United States sent Alan Shepard into space, and he was the first human piloted mission into space. He controlled his own spacecraft at once passing the Kármán line. 1962, the United States caught up. They crashed their own device into the moon. This time they chose to crash it into the far side of the moon. This is the Ranger 4. And JFK, in an attempt well, a very successful attempt to raise the morale of the United States gave us a promise in a speech he gave at Rice University in Texas. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others do. Very inspirational. So, in 1966, on February 3rd, uh, NASA sent Luna 9 onto the moon to make its first soft landing. They didn't just plow into it. They landed nice and soft uh, for something humans could survive, because that's, after all, the goal. The U.S., on the other hand, sent a probe around the moon. This was the Lunar Explorer 1. It orbited the moon and mapped its surface in order to find a nice flat spot for, eventually, us to land humans. On December 21st, 1968, the Apollo 8 mission launched these three astronauts, whose names I can't remember, with a Saturn V rocket to orbit the moon. They weren't ready to land quite yet. And on that year, the evening of Christmas Eve, they sent a live television broadcast of the Earth rising over the moon as they orbited around it. This was a very inspiring time for the U.S. And so, JFK got to keep his promise. On July 20th of 1969, Apollo 11 had landed two men on the moon, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. This is a good leap forward. And they took many pictures I really like this one, though, because uh, I think this is Buzz Aldrin, who's posing, but he had him pose in such a way that the visor would reflect Neil Armstrong with the camera. You know what this means. It's the first selfie on the moon. <laughs> and so, the space race was over. We had won. Since then, we sent 12 astronauts to the moon on future Apollo missions. So what's next? Well, we want to explore further planets. We want to explore the outer planets, the gas giants. And humans are expensive to send into space. They need food and water and all that stuff. So we need to do an unmanned mission. In the 70s was a perfect time because the planets would align so that we can use this idea of gravity assist to use less fuel as we travel into those outer planets. So in 1972, the Voyager missions were approved. And then, five years later, in the summer of 77, they were launched. Now, they were launched with the intended purpose to just get to Saturn. That's all they had the budget for. So, two years after their launch, they finally make their way to the first outer planet, Jupiter. And Voyager 1 takes this picture. You can see two of the Galilean moons. You see Io and Europa. This is the first time we had gotten close enough to these moons to see that they are not just cold, dead bodies like our own moon. They have eruptions. 
and they have uh, various activity that show they are very much alive and further inspired future missions to go and study these moons further. Two years later, in 1981, Voyager 2 took this photo of Saturn. As it did its flybys around many of its moons, this one Enceladus, and you may have heard a lot about it, about it with liquid oceans and, yeah, well, it did a flyby of Saturn too, and we see that the rings of Saturn is not just one solid ring, but they come in these layers. And these are really cool discoveries that Voyager missions are making. And so, since the technology is still going strong, and, well, these discoveries are just so darn cool, we're going to keep going. We're going to go to Uranus, but it takes a few more years, five years, to get there. Uh, at this point, Voyager 1 had actually traveled up and out of the plane of the solar system. Voyager 2 continued through the gas giants to Uranus, made it there, or, yes, Uranus, and made it there five years later, and took this picture, and traveled to the last guy, j gas giant, not to. Now, at this point, Voyager 1, which was traveling up above the plane of the solar system, took this picture upon the request of a famous astronomer, maybe you've heard of him, Carl Sagan. He requested that Voyager 1 turn around and take one last picture of Earth before it exits the solar system, or enters interstellar space, because there is a difference. And I want to read, hopefully I'll be able to, it's kind of dark, just a short <coughs> paragraph of what he said. I think a lot of people have heard parts of this. He said, we succeeded in taking that picture. If you look at it, you see it. That You see a dot, this pale blue dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who've ever, who's ever lived, lived out their lives, the aggregate of all our joys, sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, superstar, and supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And so that gives you an idea of how tiny we are. In a pixel on that huge image, everything you've ever known about in human history existed there. Well, just recently, in 2012, Voyager 1 made it into interstellar space. It passed this barrier, which we call the heliosheath, and so now it's measuring the cosmic radiation and um, various debris from interstellar space, from stars beyond our own sun. And now, oops, sorry, before that, Voyager 2 also recently also made it into interstellar space. In fact, that happened, they believe, on November 5th of this year. So very recent news. Now we move on to now. And we see the privatization of space, of space travel. We see companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, Blue Origin, followed by Jeff Bezos, which is the same person who founded Amazon. We see SpaceX is the first private company, a non-government entity, which sends something into orbit. The appropriate thing to send into orbit? A Tesla. <laughs> Jeff Bezos, uh, I forget what the rocket's name is, but I believe he was the first one to successfully perform this vertical takeoff and vertical landing with one of his rockets. And maybe you've seen the videos, maybe one of the SpaceX videos, but it's impressive. It looks like something out of a sci-fi movie, just this giant metal tube landing perfectly vertically. You couldn't even balance a pencil like that. So SpaceX it was also the first company to be contracted by NASA to resupply the International Space Station. And Blue Origins, well, part of their mission statement is to make space travel cheaper and more safe for the average citizen. So maybe the future of space travel looks like 
something more along the lines of tourism for you and for me. Something the average citizen maybe won't be able to afford, but has a chance to go out and try. And so, I really do believe that the privatization, I don't want to get into the debate of whether or not it's good for society, because there's a whole background debate there, but I do believe that through the privatization, through this competition, technology really evolves. And we see that with this vertical takeoff and vertical landing, for instance. And perhaps with more global effort too, humankind can make many more giant leaps into space. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brad. That was a fantastic talk. So, as the sort of MC, Emily started us off, uh, I get the privilege of asking the first question. So, uh, you skipped over my personal favorite uh, space creatures, and that would be Ham and Enos, the uh, chimpanzees we sent into space. So, do, do you have a personal favorite, favorite animal that we put up in orbit for space? Now something I forgot to mention with the Soviet space dogs, <laughs> this is the reason Laika was my favorite. Um, well, that's the answer. <laughs> so the Soviet space dogs uh, were stray dogs because they thought stray dogs could withstand the harsh environments of space and the training required to cram them into this space pod and launch them up on top of okay. explosives. But, they also chose female dogs, because they take up less space when they have to pee. They don't have to lift their leg up. <laughs> and Laika was also chosen because she would be good for media coverage. Because, let me see if I can get back to the picture. They say, and I quote, whoops. They chose Laika because she had a very quizzical expression. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll go to you guys. Uh, when, you know, we know from watching our own satellites and, and, and uh, rockets come back that as they enter the atmosphere, of course, there's a huge heat and you know, we require massive shields. What, if any, effect does it have when you're heading out and, for example, moving into interstellar space? Is there any kind of barrier that affects communications, that affects... All right, so the question is, we see upon re-entry into the atmosphere, um, we need heat shields in order to protect ourselves from, well, the heat, you guessed it. So, the question was, is there any kind of protection like that when we launch off or go into interstellar space? And the answer is, you don't necessarily need heat shields, because heat shields you need to protect from the friction of the atmosphere. No air in space. However, there's a lot of cosmic radiation, which the atmosphere also protects you from. And they do protect against that. I think the gold foils are sufficient for that. Um, and then as you enter interstellar space, you are still hit with cosmic radiation from distant stars, from supernova, uh, that I believe the sun's magnetic field helps it uh, deflect. So aside from gold foil, what else? I don't know. Voyagers are doing okay. Yeah. Hi. So you also skipped over my favorite mission. Why? <laughs> It's Pioneer 10 and 11. I mean, it, they did kind of the same thing that Voyager 1 and 2 did, but um, it just makes me wonder, do you have any particular favorite mission? The question was, uh, do I have any particular favorite mission? And that's actually why I chose the Voyager mission. Because, uh, man, I was in fifth grade when I first read about it. It was in a history book. Um, so I guess I got interested in astrophysics through history book, a history textbook. But 
I remember reading about the Voyager missions and seeing the pictures of Jupiter and Saturn, and I mean, they had always been artist impressions. I had no idea that that was the real thing that was floating up in the sky, it was so high. And, well, I guess for that reason, because it's so ingrained in my brain, it's the Voyager missions. And the reason I skipped Pioneer is because the Voyagers actually surpassed them and became the first objects in interstellar space. Yes? Um, so, yet again, um, you just kind of skipped over my... <laughs> <laughs> I have 20 minutes to give a talk. There are several missions. <laughs> and those would be the Vikings 1 and 2. Um, and actually, you kind of skipped over Mars entirely. Um, so my question to you is, a uh, question that I like to ask astronomers in general is where should we go to first? The moon and colonize there? Or Mars and colonize there? Well, I think part of that depends on what InSight finds. So just recently, the InSight uh, lander was launched to Mars. And oh, the question was where should we go first, the moon or Mars? Um, so the InSight's mission is essentially to take these vital signals of Mars. It's got a heat flow probe, which will go below uh, the ground in Mars to measure any heat coming from the core. And it's going to measure, it's going to have seismic measurements as well. So it's seeing if the planet has an active core, essentially. And if it does, it's more similar to Earth. And as far as we know, right, the moon is a cold, dead thing. <laughs> So, I would have to lean towards Mars. Last one? Yeah. Uh, so, I think it's evidenced by the fact that you pictures of this, that all of this space exploration stuff, there's been a couple moments where there's a picture, like the pale blue dot one of those pictures, mm -hmm. and then Earth Rise is one of those pictures that gets into the media and everyone's like, wow. Yeah. What do you think the next one is going to be? <laughs> so, the question is um, a common theme in astronomy is. They send back these pictures, and uh, they get a lot of wow from the media sending them out. And so what do I think the next picture is going to be? Well, we've got all the planets in our solar system, unless we find a new one drifting out very far away. I think this wouldn't be in our lifetime, but what if we had a close-up picture of a nearby star? Alpha Centauri. I think that would get a lot of attention, but again, we're not talking in any of our lifetimes here in this room. Unless we really advance in solar sails. <laughs> okay, so fair warning. I know you come to AOT for the science, and the science is good, but my talk tonight is going to be a little bit more of a people talk, a little bit of a history talk. There will be some science in the first, don't worry. But people make science, so it feels important to stop and talk about the people that are once in a while. So, stellar inquiries. So my title promises you something stellar. So we'll start off with some stars. So the, these are the three stars that I'm going to talk about tonight. Maybe not the stars that you normally think about when you come to AOT, but stars nonetheless. <coughs> and as you might guess, based on the second word in the title, they all have something in common. Uh, notably, they're not straight. So, stellar inquiries. Okay. Uh, also, you might notice from the pictures, based solely on the quality of the pictures, these three people, uh, Frank Kamini, Sally Bride, and Nergis Mavalava. No, ah, I knew I was going to get that wrong. Okay. Mavalava. There we go. Uh, so, based on the pictures, the quality of the pictures, you might also guess that all three of these people maybe didn't exist in the same time period. They didn't quite exist in the same environments, um, and as a result, it has some interesting effects on their careers. All three of them are PhD holders in physics or astronomy, um, and we'll see as we go through the talk exactly what that did to their lives and to their careers. Okay, so starting from the beginning, we've got Frank. So Frank was born in 1925. Um, as might be expected, based on that time period, he did get drafted and go to World War II, um, upon returning from World War II, he went back to college. First to Queens College in New York, uh, and then later to uh, Harvard for his master's and PhD, earning his PhD at Harvard uh, in specifically astronomy, 
1956. Uh, shortly after graduating, he moved to Washington, D.C. and started teaching at Georgetown University. He taught there for about a year and then decided maybe that wasn't quite what he wanted to do in his life. <clears throat> and he was recruited by the U.S. Army Map Service in 1957, specifically, I know, July of 1957. So he started working with the U.S. Army's Map Service. He did serve with the Army in World War II, so it wasn't a big stretch. He already had some connections. <clears throat> uh, however, that didn't last very long. Uh, and in fact, by December of that same year, he had been fired. Uh, and so at this time, uh, this was sort of a systematic thing, if you go back and look at the history books. Um, but at this time, uh, specifically after 1953, there was an executive order that was written as broadly as to allow uh, the federal government to fire um, any civil servants, any federal employees, specifically because they were suspected to be gay or lesbian or anything not straight. Um, and so that was that was the case. Frank had been approached um, by some some officers, and they had told him that they had suspicions that he was gay. Uh, could he confirm or deny? Uh, he chose not to respond. Actually, he didn't confirm or deny. But that was that was enough. That was grounds enough to fire him. And so they did. And unfortunately, at this time, as we might have learned from Brian's talk, this was a pretty hot in time for space and for astronomy. Right, Sputnik was launched in October of 1957. Um, and then in mid-1958, NASA was, was founded. So there were lots of jobs to be had in astronomy, specifically federally funded jobs in astronomy. Um, however, Frank was no longer eligible for them because on every job application that you file, um, it's going to ask about your previous employment and if you've been fired for any reason, and he would have to admit that on every other job. So he did, he did interview, um, he did go to places to try to get jobs, he was turned down every time. And so as a result of that, he decided to try to do something about it. Um, first appealing his termination to the district court in D.C., uh, and then further up to the appeals court in D.C., and eventually, in 1961, he petitioned the Supreme Court to hear his case of wrongful termination <clears throat> in January of 1961. Uh, in March, they declined to hear it, and that was the end. That was, that was it. There was no more astronomy to be had for the rest of Frank's life. Uh, he did notably go on to do lots of other things, um, with his life, this sort of fueled a lot of passion for him. He became an activist. And so later in 1961, he co-founded the Madison Society of Washington, D.C. So the Madison, the Madison, the Madison Society, um, and a bunch of other groups. Uh, there were starting to be groups uh, specifically advocating for gay and lesbian rights around this time. There were a couple other chapters in Madison societies. Um, there were some other ones, such as the Dollars of Bilitis, they were also advocating for rights, for equal rights. Um, so Frank co-founded the DC chapter of that, and they advocated. Um, notably, in April of 1965, they picketed the White House specifically for federal treatment of gays and lesbians. This is noted quite possibly as one of the first uh, official protests to be specifically about gay and lesbian rights. Uh, You'll note, if you know anything about gay history, um, 1965 is before 1969, which is when the famed Stonewall riots happened. So this was before then. Um, this was before any of that really started to happen. Um, and then also notably in 1973, uh, Frank is generally given credit for this um, in convincing the American Psychiatric Association to declassify homosexuality as a mental disorder. And so he had lobbied for that for a long time. He testified. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and eventually they did. They, they took a vote. They decided it was no longer a mental disorder. And Frank actually quit later that with the stroke of a pen, they had in mass cured all of them of their mental illnesses. Uh, so that was that. Um, again, he never did any more astronomy. Um, however, he did live long enough uh, in 2009 to be uh, officially, formally apologized to by the federal government for his termination. And 1957. Um, uh, so that happened in 2009. He did unfortunately die uh, two years later in 2011, uh, somewhat ironically on National Coming Out Day. Um, so that's weird. Uh, he died of heart failure. Um, and unfortunately, since he did die in 2011, he didn't quite live long enough to be honored by the American Astronomical Society for his contributions to equal rights um, for gays and lesbians. However, they did at their winter meeting approximately four months after his death, honor uh, for that. 
Okay, so is French. Uh, we'll move forward to Sally Wright, who maybe sounds familiar to you. She's a little bit more of a household name than either of the other two people that I'm going to talk about or have talked about. So Sally Wright was born in 1951. Um, she went on, she went to college. Um, she went to Stanford, earning her bachelor's in both physics and English, a point that I mentioned for a later reason that will become obvious. Um, she stayed at Stanford for her master's and PhD, earning her PhD in physics in 1978. Immediately after graduating, she signed up for the astronaut training program. Uh, she succeeded well, she did well there. Um, and in 1983, became the first US woman to space. Two Russian women did beat her uh, to space, but she was the first US woman, woman and uh, also the youngest US person ever to make it to space at the age of 32. Uh, she did have a second mission to space the following year. Um, however, that was it. She didn't go any further on any further missions to space, in part because in 1986 the Challenger disaster happened, uh, and that halted the space shuttle program for approximately three years while they investigated. Sally did notably serve on both the Challenger committee that was charged with investigating the accident, as well as the Columbia mission. She served on the committee investigating that one as well. Uh, she was the only person to serve on both committees. Uh, so in 1987, she retired from NASA, uh, went to UC San Diego, uh, became a professor of physics, that's what her training was in after all, uh, and she taught at UC San Diego for a long time. Uh, in 2001, she co-founded, along with uh, another UC San Diego professor, Tam O'Shaughnessy, and three of their friends, they co-founded uh, Sally Ride Science, which was a nonprofit specifically aimed at encouraging uh, young women and girls to study science, to study space. And uh, as part of that in initiative, uh, Sally and Tam uh, co-wrote a number of children's books aimed at that as well, and teaching young girls and women about science and getting them interested in pursuing that as a career. Uh, she would go on later to die in 2012 uh, from a 17-month uh, battle with pancreatic cancer. So you'll notice on this timeline, uh, at no point have I talked about the fact she's not straight. Uh, and so that was actually on purpose, um, because no one actually knew that. Uh, some people knew that. Her family knew that. Um, obviously, her partner, Tam, who I mentioned a minute ago, also knew that. Um, but this line was snuck into her obituary in the New York Times, sort of on the second to last paragraph, uh, part of a middle sentence. Uh, Dr. Wright is survived by her partner 27 years, almost three decades. She was partnered to this woman, and none of her co-workers knew that. Uh, no one that she saw regularly, none of her business associates knew that. This was a, a startling surprise. Um, so some of the headlines that ran the obituary were sort of innocuous, the New York Times one was. Uh, some of the other ones weren't. They were, there was obvious surprise. People were very caught off guard by this. Um, and so in later uh, years, Tam opened up a little bit and discussed some of this um, in later interviews. Uh, noting why Sally hadn't decided to come out publicly. Uh, and so, in one particular instance, she said that Sally didn't want to hurt NASA by coming out. Um, in another instance, uh, they, she talked about the fact that they started this nonprofit for science education. Um, she said that the company had depended on corporate sponsorships, and they were afraid back then that if they came out publicly, that would affect their eventual goal of helping young women and girls uh, study science. They were afraid they wouldn't get the support that they needed. Uh, so that's unfortunate, right? Unlike our first case where uh, Frank was sort of out, but he was in a hostile environment. He was outed in a hostile environment. Sally wasn't necessarily outed. She was outed after her death. Um, this was with her permission that Tam had done this. They put it, she would put it in her obituary. But sort of passively, the environment it sort of prevented her from coming out during her life. Okay, so now I'll end with our third example, our third star of this evening. Uh, and that's Dr. Nergis Mavalava. Mavalava? Mavalava? I'll get it right. I'm sorry. Um, so she was born in 1968 in Pakistan, actually. She immigrated to the U.S., um, earning her Ph.D. in physics from MIT in 1997. Uh, her Ph.D. advisor was Rainer Weiss, who you can see pictured here in the middle. You may recognize that name as uh, a recent winner of a Nobel Prize uh, for gravitational waves in particular. In fact, some of her uh, design work, I believe, and her thesis was incorporated into LIGO. 
when they were building it. Um, after earning her PhD, she had a postdoc and a research position at Caltech uh, and up, until th up until 2002. In 2002, she moved back to, to MIT and joined the faculty there. Uh, in 2010, she was awarded uh, MacArthur Fellow. She was named a MacArthur Fellow, which um, is a pretty prestigious award, uh, though, let's see. It's effectively just half a million dollars that they give you. You can do pretty much anything you want with. It's awarded for creativity and innovation. Um, so there's been about a thousand uh, MacArthur Fellows ever named. It's more commonly known as the Genius Grants, MacArthur Genius Grants. Um, and so uh, there have been about a thousand MacArthur Fellows who have, have ever been named. Uh, about 50 of them have ever gone to a physicist. Uh, so it's a pretty big deal, the fact that she earned that. And then in February 2006, there was the LIGO announcement where everyone is all of a sudden talking about gravitational waves all the time. And so as a, as a part of that, um, she had a few interviews afterwards. Uh, and pr prior to that, popular science wasn't super interested in gravitational waves, right? They'd never been uh, detected, so no one really ever interviewed her. Uh, it turns out she had been out and open uh, for a very long time. Uh, in fact, dating back to graduate school, um, uh, the woman she was dating at the time had come to the lab, right? No one had ever questioned that, no one had ever given a hard time uh, for any of that. And in fact, the work environment was very supportive of that, which is, again, a bit of a departure from either of our two previous cases. Uh, and so, with that, let me recap a little bit, right? So I said Frank existed uh, in an environment that was openly hostile, right? He was fired for the suspicion of being gay. It wasn't actually any proof, he was just suspected of being gay, and he was fired. He had no more astronomical career. Um, Sally uh, didn't come out until after her death, so it's more of a passive environment in that case, perhaps. Um, but again, she wasn't she wasn't quite out in her lifetime. Uh, and there is, uh, in contrast, has been out for most of her graduate career uh, and continues to be out today. Obviously, she has a family, she has a wife and kids. And so you might look at this and think, sort of, right? We're scientists. We're going to hypothesize a bit. Um, you might think that, oh, right, so time has gone on, the environment has improved a bit, right? That's sort of the trend that I'm presenting here. The environment's gotten a little better from here to here, from like hostile to passive to, to accepting. It's a good hypothesis. Uh, it turns out in 2015, uh, the American Physical Society decided to sort of test that hypothesis. And they commissioned a committee who made a report, uh, gathered a whole bunch of data. This wasn't actually a very well-studied phenomenon, uh, people being out in STEM. And so they, they wrote up a report, and there are a whole bunch of findings from that report. I want to list them all here. You should definitely go read them. It's a very interesting report. However, there are two relevant findings here. Um, and that is, whereas I've just presented this case where Nergus is now fully out and has been since graduate school, uh, there's a lot of people that don't feel that way. Right? There are, if you add these numbers up, uh, about one in third, one in three people, when asked this question or when given this prompt, there is pressure for LGBT employees to stay closeted. Agree. They, one in three people felt that there was definitely pressure for people to not come out at work. Two thirds of them disagreed. They thought there wasn't pressure. But one in three definitely felt that there was. Um, and then, so so maybe there's still some environmental problems to be discussed. Um, and then also, it sort of depends on who you ask, right? So I'm talking mostly about the environment, the culture that's affecting everyone. However, there are specific uh, needs of other people including trans and gender non-conforming physicists, um, who actively experience hostility, right? So according to this statistic, uh, about 60% of the trans physicists that were queued, that were questioned here, um, had observed harassment, uh, and about 49% of them had been the direct result, or they'd been the, the direct target of said harassment. So half of all the trans physicists have been directly harassed. That's not okay. Um, in fact, if you do go to read this, there are uh, qualitative statements people have to survey that can write in specific examples. Some of them are shocking, like people actively being yelled out in the hallway for, for being trans. Um, so, so, whereas on the previous slide I said maybe it was getting better, maybe there's a case to be made for that. It could get even better though, right? There's still work to be done. Um, and so along that lines, uh, there were some some academic resources. I'm not going to claim to, to be the expert on this. Um, however, there are people who are experts on this who have done the research. Um, and so in terms of academic resources that you can go look to sort of try to maybe be involved in making it better. Uh, 
the climate report, in addition to its data and analysis, also commissions some recommendations. So specifically, they refer to more community-wide things, so things about going to conferences uh, or publishing in journals. <coughs> the WAS, the American Astronomical Society, also uh, has a best practices guide that's more specific to department resources, so things your home department could do, as well as sort of interpersonal things, so suggestions for mentoring, um, if you find yourself mentoring um, an LGBT plus student. Uh, and so those are all academic things, um, and I realize maybe most of the audience isn't in the academy. Uh, and so as science consumers or science enthusiasts, there's also other things you can do. Um, and while you maybe can't directly affect the work environment of uh, physicists themselves, um, you can certainly do other things. And so amongst that, you could support um, openly out and proud physicists or scientists in general. And there are some websites for that. Uh, 500 Career Scientists has a whole bunch of uh, sort of biographies of, of out and proud scientists who have submitted them themselves. Um, there's actually more than 500. The, the URL didn't exactly last very long when people started submitting. If you're on uh, social media, there's a whole bunch of hashtags. This is a very uh, truncated list. There's a whole bunch of hashtags that people tweet about or Instagram about uh, frequently. Um, and you can also look for people to support there um, if you're interested in their work. And honestly, one of the easiest things to do is just to tell fuller stories, right? So you want to tell detailed stories when you're talking about science. So for instance, when you're looking up things about Sally Ride, don't and omit the fact that she had a partner for 27 years. Um, and it, so tell that part of the story as well. And specifically, I'm saying that because if you go and look up some biographies of hers online, it will list the fact that she was married to a man for the earlier parts of 1980. And then that's it. There are no other spouses listed because she wasn't technically married to Tam. She couldn't be officially married to Tam. But those three decades of her life that they spent together. So, so I guess the, the main takeaway there is just don't omit certain parts of the story just because they aren't convenient. So with that, we'll conclude. Thank you, Robert. So, LGBT history is a very sad story to tell sometimes because it, it's a very dark history that a lot of people haven't maybe even heard of or have a difficult time accepting. Uh, for example, I went to uh, the University of Wyoming for my undergraduate, which of course uh, has the uh, terrible black mark of Matthew Shepard in its history. Uh, but really, we would benefit from focusing on the uh, a very positive thing. So you focus on the sort of the mantra, it gets better. So what what do you think is the, the most bright light, the, the it gets better moment that you think we should, you know, leave today thinking about? Well, so I think you told me you were gonna ask this question uh, beforehand. <laughs> someone, don't immediately ask them if they're a guy, don't immediately start talking to them about girls as if that is a thing that they're definitely going to connect to, because there's plenty of guys that won't, even people who aren't gay or bi, who's, um, there are plenty of people who won't connect to that, there are other ways to make connections that don't involve that in particular. Um, so yeah, so just open, or be open in your interactions so that such that you can 
find out more about that person without starting off at a, a spot that they're going to have to somehow weasel their right, way out of, or, it, yeah. Why yes. did you pick these three physicists? Okay, so the question, I forgot to repeat Alice's question, sorry. Um, the question was, uh, why did I pick these three physicists? Um, okay, so the short answer to that is Google. <laughs> uh, the longer answer to that is that I've actually met Nair just before. She's a fantastic woman. She has connections to LSU. In fact, um, one of her former students is a faculty at the, in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Um, the other two, yeah, I don't know. I remember being surprised learning that Sally Ride um, wasn't straight. Um, I actually remember, I think, reading about that at the time and being like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so when I started looking her up again, that, that sort of popped back up, and I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to talk about this. Uh, yeah, I don't have any specific reason for picking Frank. Um, he's just a, a really old example, like the 50s, right? This was, um, yeah, I don't know. So it was before Snowball, so, and he was doing things. So that survey was sent to, so it was commissioned by the American Physical Society. Uh, for the survey, they randomly sent 30% of the membership of the APS. That survey of those 30%, um, about 2,500 responded, um, and those are the results. So there are answers in there from non-gay uh, or lesbian or bi transgender people, um, but I mean they have a sense for that environment as well, right? If you don't know any colleagues that aren't LGBT, then maybe you, if you think about it, maybe you're like, well that's kind of weird, right? Maybe there's something I'm not quite picking up on because I'm, I'm not that. So uh, the question was, Sally Ride was also a, a professional tennis player. And that is true. Um, Sally Ride did professionally play tennis. Actually, Tam also professionally played tennis. That is how they met. Um, they were childhood friends um, who had both grown up in those circles. And, and that is, yeah, that's that. Uh, yeah, 2,500, yeah. Um, it was, uh, not going to disagree with you there. Um, so the question was, uh, 2,500 people responded to the APS survey, trans people are 0.3% of the population. Um, what's the overlap there? Um, if I remember correctly, uh, of the 2,500 respondents that the APS had, 2.5% uh, of that number, whatever that number is, um, were not straight or not cis. Um, and I don't recall what number of those were specifically not cisgender. Um, I do know it was noted. It was noted a couple times in the report itself. If you read it, uh, it makes a point of saying that 2.5 percent of the overall people that responded were not straight or cis. Um, however, of the category of 18 to 25, 16 percent were not straight or cis. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking, maybe you've used a glossary, so I'm sure we're all familiar with the terms lesbian and, and gay and bisexual, but could you please explain to us cisgender? Yeah, so cisgender just means that you, your sex assigned at birth is the same as the gender that you currently have. Uh, trans is the reverse of that. The sex you were assigned at birth does not agree with the gender identity that you currently have. And can you explain gender? No. <laughs> okay, I'm giving you like the next five AOT talks. <laughs> All right, we'll pencil you in. <laughs> Come back from January through May. AOT will become gender on tap. <laughs> I was, was going to say, you should talk about Alan's tour
Yeah, yeah that's true. So the, the comment was Alan Turing. Um, I specifically didn't pick him because I sort of felt like everyone maybe knows about Alan Turing. Um, I could be wrong. I did give this practice talk earlier. It was like, maybe half the things I said aren't general knowledge. Who knows? Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, Alan Turing um, is effectively the founder of computer science. Um, he helped win World War II as well, uh, specifically for his contributions. Um, the British government, he was a British citizen, the British government did not allow homosexuality at the time, uh, not that the US was super great either, as we saw from Frank. Um, and he, yeah, he later committed suicide because of that. We went on a very dark note there, though. So, <laughs> anyone's got a lighter question? So the question was, um, do I think it's possible to use science as sort of a uh, Trojan horse, if you will, um, to sort of uh, increase um, better conditions for, for non-straight and non-cis people in the world? And I think, honestly, the answer is yes. Um, so notably, if you're looking up stuff about Nergis, um, I mentioned that she was born in Pakistan. She's been out and proud since graduate school. Um, Pakistan is maybe not the best place in the world for people who are a lesbian. Um, however, Pakistan celebrated her once they found out that uh, she contributed to the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, they were all about it. So, so it's an interesting point. Uh, and additionally, so also on those lines, but on a more practical term, uh, there's also, right, so international collaborations, such as the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, um, bring together a whole bunch of scientists from a bunch of different places. And so when they all have to get together and exist, they have to sort of agree on a code of conduct. And so that's another way, maybe once you've worked at the lab for a long time, you go back and you, you learn to treat people a different way, and that sort of carries over into wherever you came from. Uh, so let's start off with a contentious question. We need a favorite sci-fi movie. Jeff says 2001 Space Odyssey. Is that right? Well, um... 1968 was exactly 50 years ago. Um, I was uh, 14, and I, uh, it was a very big year. Uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey came out, and uh, as as Brad was saying, Apollo 8 uh, went around the moon at Christmas time. So almost exactly 50 years ago. Um, by the way, that was Jim Lovell, Frank Boyle, William Anders. Um, the, um, anyway, uh, I went to see uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey eight times in the theater uh, when it came out. It was an extremely big thing for me. I'm still bitter about the fact that I cannot go up to the space station and eat at Howard Johnson's. Um, but there's still time. <laughs> And I have my uh, official Hallmark Hal ornament on the top of my tree. So. Does it glow? Well, if you push the button, it talks. Yes, it glows. The eye glows, yes. Good, perfect. All right, let's move on. Any questions from the studio audience? Yes? So what, what's everybody else's favorite sci-fi movie? You're gonna go with Stargate, the original Stargate movie. Yeah. Is that a good answer? <clears throat> yeah. It's, I'm gonna go that it's very old, but uh, yeah, it probably doesn't hold up well. But you should still go watch it. Matrix is a science fiction. Yes, it's real. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't really watch a lot of sci-fi movies. What's that? Horror movie. One of the Apollo missions. Apollo 
18 with the little alien rocks that uh, kill everyone. Um, I guess that one. <laughs> Any other questions? Please. scientific. Um, so one of the reasons the APS commissioned that report is there's not a whole lot of data on this area. Um, one of the largest samples was, sample data samples on this, was specifically for STEM fields taken in 2014. Um, the APS published the report in 2015. Uh, so to answer your question, no one currently actually knows if uh, LGBTQ plus people are underrepresented in science, or overrepresented, or exactly right proportion to the population. Nobody knows. Nobody has gathered enough data to actually answer that question. What do you think, though? <laughs> I thought we were doing science. <laughs> it's an opinion. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't have any. That's, that's it's fair. actually right. Just perfect. Just perfect. You think we're on par? We're... Well, I'm guessing that just generally, yes. Okay. Everywhere, okay. the percentage is both the same. Who knows? We'll find out. I can tell you the people that are doing the study if you want to go look them up. Maybe they have preliminary answers that they would wish to share with you. They probably don't. You have to factor in the out percentage. I mean, you also have to get really good information on like the number of out people in the general population too, which is very difficult to do. It's not a thing that is asked about regularly on general population surveys. Any other questions? This is like the worst audience ever. <laughs> Since Laika came up so much, that if everyone should watch the movie My Life as a Dog, which is a classic, and it's a it's a Scandinavian movie. It's about a uh, it's about a kid who uh, is unhappy in her life, and she's always comparing it to Laika's life, and so that's why it's called My Life as a Dog. It might be on Netflix. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Wasn't that actually answer the Has question? Has anyone else heard of this movie? No. No. Okay, so I'm. I, I'm sorry. So we're now going to all say what animal. For instance, if we go to Mars, should we take some pets with us? Um, so, um, you ready, Brad? I want to bring a giraffe. Tyler, it's the same thing. But in order for you to bring the giraffe, you have to bring the human to Mars. Well, right? what? We've already put on human space. We could populate Mars with giraffes. <laughs> That's animal cruelty. There's some work to be done first. If you want to bring live giraffes to Mars, <laughs> we have to giraffe a foreman. <laughs> uh, no specific scientific reason, but I'm going to go with foxes. Foxes are, are, are great. Foxes are great. <laughs> Very photogenic. They would look great. <laughs> Weightless or yeah, blending in with Mars. Mars. Running around on the moon. They'd be great. They'd be great. They'd have the same goal. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, dogs gotta do it. I'd send a cat up, just even the playing field. Pretty self sufficient. They can do well in a rocket ship. Just sleep the whole way. Like, that's great. I don't know if this is true. But the last time I practiced this talk, we looked up if cats have been sent into space. And apparently, uh, among the space race, I don't know if this is true, but it said that France had sent cats, cats into space, but they were overlooked because we live in a dog-ruled world. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's unfortunate. Yes. So I'm going to see something like that, and this is, this is just for you. So when people, when people go to Mars, that's going to happen. People always have pets, and they're going to want pets. So if you have to tell them what pet they can bring, what do you tell them they can bring? Tardy grades. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. Yes, but they'll probably live. That's <laughs> also back to Mars. Those fellas. Oh, probably. But for different reasons. <laughs> you got one over there. Um, when we came with the fruit flies, what did we learn? What the fruit flies? Yes, the question is what became of the fruit flies? Um, we did recover them uh, alive upon landing, which is amazing because we couldn't do the same with the rhesus monkey. Um, they just did several experiments on them to see what the uh, post-flight effects of the cosmic radiation were. And uh, the reason is because their genetic code is 75% analogous to that of the human. So a lot of the diseases that they can contract from the effects of cosmic radiation have some analogous disease to humans. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what specifically they found, uh, but they were alive when they found them. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, space princess. Thank you. So we all know cockroaches can survive anywhere. <laughs> Don't put them on Mars. <laughs> well, that's going to be my question. No, stop your question. Why? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay. Do you think that cockroaches could survive on Mars? In the present day? Yeah. Maybe we should try. No. Well, we could do an experiment in the lab. Okay. We could reproduce the conditions on Mars. Uh, it's possible that they, you know, I mean, you know, lots of things can live sort of in suspended animation for a long time. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that uh, there aren't already cockroaches on Mars uh, that snuck into some piece of equipment. Um, so. Anyone else have any uh, comments about cockroaches on Mars? <laughs> oh, Brett. If it is true that they can survive several minutes with their head chopped off, I don't doubt they will survive Mars. I mean, chickens can too. Yeah, but let's put chickens off. <laughs> Better. Okay, so briefly. Okay, I do have one other question. Okay. And that is, so we heard about what your favorite mission was, your, your extraterrestrial mission. But we actually, we haven't heard from Jeff and Robert and Rachel. Well, I just wanted to bring up, because uh, New Horizons, because um, not only did it go past Pluto, but it's coming up on January 1st, it's going to be actually taking a picture of a whole new planet. Um, and it's actually going closer to this uh, Kuiper Belt object than it did to Pluto, so it's going to be quite cool. Even though it's it's relatively small, it's just a few a few miles across. But uh, I predict it looks like a potato. Which one? <laughs> Which one? Ultima Thule. Ooh, that's a good one. Ultima Thule. I don't remember the number, but that's the name they gave it. Ah, uh, not as well read on space missions. I'm going to go with. Cassini, though, right? That was the one that went to Saturn, took a bunch of pictures, crashed into Saturn. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm going to go with that one, because, like, who gets to swan dive into the thing that you went to go study and then die? Who gets to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, same as Robert, I'm not 
particularly versed in this space. But I'm just going to say probably like Curiosity or any of the Mars rovers because they're doing the good work up there and I don't know, they're still kicking and saying happy birthday to themselves on their birthday. <laughs> I was just going to ask for a moment's silence for opportunity. <laughs> We're down to one rover. Well, on that somber note. <laughs>